Number 40, number 40. Threaten 
Before the prayer, we'll be singing 618. 618. <clears throat> Pardon me, 618. pray with me. Our God, our Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've given to us and for this opportunity to come together this evening and study and learn more about thy will. 
Father, we thank you for this church that meets here in Boiling Springs. We thank you for our elders. And Father, we thank you for being with them over the past number of days and months. While they've had to make some very, very tough decisions, we thank you for working with them. Father, we thank you for our deacons, we thank you for our teachers, and all the members that work collectively to preach the name of Jesus Christ throughout this area and beyond. Father, we are especially thankful for Brother Michael and his family for coming to be our new minister. Father, we pray that you will be with him and his family and give them a long tenure and successful career as he works with this congregation. Father, we come to you now asking that you will be with the sick of the congregation. We bring to you the name of Kathy Charles Van Over's sister. We pray, Father, that you will be with the doctors and nurses that care for her, and that they will render great comfort to her during her struggle. Father, I pray that you will be with Laura Grizzle and other members of this congregation. Be with those who care for them, and render unto them a reasonable measure of good health, Father, if it be thy will. Father, we come to you now confessing to you that from time to time we fall short of what you would have us to be. We confess to you, Father, that we sin, and we pray, Father, that you will forgive us of any wrong that's in our lives. But, Father, we ask you for your strength as we go forward that we can be more like Jesus every day. Father, we want to pray for our military men and women, especially those that are stationed in difficult places. We pray, Father, that you will be with them, bring them home as quickly as possible, and keep them safe. Father, we pray for the church that met worldwide today. We pray, Father, that many good things were said and done and much good was accomplished. Father, we come to you now thanking you for all the blessings of this life, but our greatest blessing is in Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, Father, gave his life, although he had no sin. He gave his life and shed his blood, Father, that we might live, and we thank you so much for that. Father, we ask that you will go with us now, be with us in everything that we do that's right and good. But, Father, we also ask that you defeat us when we're wrong. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Please mark in your hymnals 714, 714 will be the song of encouragement after the lesson. After you have that mark, if you would, please turn to number 419, 419. Let us all sing. Lord, we come before thee now.
just for a moment there to make sure it was really time for me to get up. You know, I've got to learn kind of the way things are done. For example, that on Sunday morning, there's not a song. I go ahead and start class and uh, be in the auditorium so one of the elders doesn't have to come looking for me. So good to see you, and we are so excited to be with you. I appreciate so much your terms of uh, affection and support that you have given to myself and my family. Last night was wonderful. It was a great time that we had to be with brothers and sisters here. And I appreciate all of the acts of kindness and the gifts and the cards and the thoughts. I appreciate Joe and Christy for opening their home and their place and sharing that with us that we, we might have that occasion. If you would turn in your Bible, to Colossians chapter 3, read with me verses 1 through 3, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. There's a statement of an expectation here. An if-then statement. If it is true, that you were raised with Christ. If it is true that, that you are one who has encountered Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, if you have been given a new life, if that's the case, then that changes everything about you. That changes your identity that changes your purpose, your motive. It changes your goals. If then you were raised with Christ, set your mind, seek, set your affections on things above. What is it that, that is different about a Christian? Our young people who are in the school system realize that, um, well, whether you're in the school system or not, whether you're in the school system or, or uh, a home school or whatever it may be, you realize that there's something different. But especially in the school atmosphere, you realize that daily, as you are around others that are your age, your peers, you realize that there's something different, right? At, at there, there should be, right? There's an expectation as Christians for us to live differently from the world, and that's not always easy, especially, especially for young people, especially for teenagers. It's just, it's what we call peer pressure, and there's a reason it's called pressure, because there is a pressure to conform, there is a pressure to be like those around us, 
And, and so, you know, Paul wrote, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye, what, transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that is, that your life shows, you may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. That's who we become. That is the transformation that takes place. Why? Because we died with Christ. And we didn't stop there. We were raised with him. And as he proclaimed that victory over death, that victory over hell, that victory over sin, then we become victorious in him if our life is hidden with Christ. And notice that at the end of verse 3. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And that's the thought that I'd like for us to focus on for the next few moments. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now think about the implications of that statement. What does that mean? It means that I really no longer have an identity of my own. Oh, sure. I mean, I'm me, and, and, and I look like me, and I have my name, and I like the things I like. There's certain, like, those characteristics, those personalities. But it, when it comes to the very essence of my identity, it isn't Michael, it's Christ. And, and for you, it's the same as a child of God. And so the things that I do in life become filtered through that concept. And, uh, you know, a while back, there were bracelets that uh, the young, young people like to wear. What would Jesus do? As a security officer in a mall in Florence, Alabama, I uh, arrested a teenager for shoplifting, and one of the things that he stole was that bracelet. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this isn't what Jesus would do. You see, you see, there's a difference, though, between a fad and an identity. And Christianity for us isn't, it's not a fad, right? It's an identity. It's who I, because, why? Because Jesus Christ died for me. He saved me. I was, I was a sinner I, I, I lost with no hope. I was headed for a devil's hell. And Jesus died for me. And I owe him everything. Not most things, not a certain amount of time, but everything, everything about my life. If then you were raised with Christ, what do we do? We set our affections on things above. We set our mind on things above. And so that means then that I, I live life thinking heavenly. I live life thinking about, about my relationship with God and my desire is heaven. And so anything and everything, bar none, it doesn't matter what it is, anything and everything in this life that might stand in the way of me having my affections on things above has got to go. It just doesn't belong in the life of a Christian if it gets in the way of my relationship with God. Over in Colossians chapter 2, previous chapter in verses 12 and 13, we read, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and your sins and the, uncircumcis and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now think about for a moment that that concept, that idea. And I know that, I know you've thought about this a lot. I know you've talked about it a lot. But I want you to really think about the weight of this statement. I have been forgiven. And I am forgiven. Now the things that you've done in your life that you're ashamed of? Are there things that 
you wish you had not done, hurtful things that you've said that you wish you had not said. For the child of God, for one who is faithful to Christ, who is, who is seeking God and living in that light, then it's not just, I have been forgiven. It is, I am forgiven. And there's a difference in those two statements. It is that we continue in this state of forgiveness. I want you to be sure. God wants you to be sure that you have the joy of your salvation. And we need to live this life with the joy of our salvation because I tell you, when you fully grasp that idea, the joy of your salvation, and you don't want to lose that. When you have the joy of salvation, then the devil has nothing that he can offer you that's better than that. You're rich. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us that if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, and that tense there is a continual tense, keeps on cleansing, cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. And so say it in your mind. Say it, say it, but only say it, friend. Please, please don't lie to yourself because you can't lie to God. If it's true, if you really believe it, Say it in your mind. I am forgiven. And if you have any doubt that keeps you from having the joy of that salvation, and I do pray and I hope and I beg and I plead that you will not leave this building here tonight with anything less than the full assurance of your salvation. It is worth everything. It is worth so much that it cost the Son of God his blood. And there is no sacrifice that you can make that could ever be so great as to merit that, that worth. And yet, it's so easy to just throw it away. If then, if you have been risen with Christ, then keep seeking those things which are above. If you were buried with Christ, and if you have been risen, you have been changed. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 2, and verses 1 through 6. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, and trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You realize what that means, child of God? That you are an heir to the heavenly places. And God, who, who has cleansed you through the blood, through the sacrifice of his son, who, who gave you that cleansing when you took that death, burial, and resurrection as your own in the waters of baptism, that you have become an heir with Christ to the heavenly places. That's, folks, that is a victorious life right there. Uh, you can go to the bookstores and you can go to the self-help sections and you can read all these things about be, how to be successful, how to be, have a victorious life, and all of those, those grand scheme ideas, but it's so simple. And it's right here. Sacrifice yourself to God. Take the identity of one who is hidden with Christ. 
in God. And then seek those things which are above. Seek that which is spiritual, a continual search, a constant striving. And Jesus told us in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, strive to enter by the narrow door, <clears throat> that narrow way. It isn't easy. It calls for sacrifice. It calls for a full self-sacrifice. And it calls for a daily spiritual battle. We fight a spiritual battle. And we can never give up. And we can never relent. First of all, there's the spiritual battle that we face within ourselves as the Spirit struggles with the flesh. And it's a battle that we can never, ever, ever stop striving for. I may have shared this with you already, but you'll probably hear me say it a lot. If you're, if you're struggling, that's a good thing. Don't stop struggling. Now, sometimes folks will come to me and say, say, I, I, I need to talk. I'm struggling with sin. I say, good. I'm so glad to hear it. Say, but you don't understand. You didn't, you didn't hear me. I said, I'm struggling with sin. I said, yeah, the key word is, you're struggling. You haven't given up. You haven't given up. Satan hasn't won because you're still struggling, because you're still fighting. And if you do that through the power of God, if you keep doing that, you will succeed. God did not place you in a place where you couldn't win. The victory is ours. The victory is ours. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You see, the sad thing is that so often when people are struggling, that they're striving in their lives, that they feel like they have to do it alone. It's not a battle you need to fight alone. It's not a battle that you can fight and win alone. God gave us each other for a reason. He gave us each other because he knows that we need each other. We need our spiritual family. And you know what? It's okay to say, I'm struggling. It's okay to say, I have sinned. Guess what? You're not alone. You can look around in this auditorium and every single person that you see in this auditorium who has reached that age of being accountable for their sins, they can say the same thing. We're not alone in that struggle. We have each other. We have each other to help us to walk and to seek to enter in by that narrow gate, to walk that straight and narrow path, that straight and narrow way, to lean on each other, to forgive each other, to pray for each other, to counsel with each other. We need each other. There is strength in unity. Paul here to, to the, the uh, Philemon, he says, he says now, he says, you let your, or, the, or excuse me, to the Philippian church says, you let your conversation be as that which is becometh of the gospel of Christ. And he says, he says, you strive together. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus and consider what he did for you lest you become weary and faint in your mind and say, I just, it's just not worth it. Folks, it's worth it. Keep struggling, keep fighting, keep going, keep striving. It's worth it. 
Jesus thought it was worth dying for. And isn't it wonderful that we indeed have this great cloud of witnesses of those who have gone before, spoken of here in Hebrews chapter 12. Those who have gone before, those who entered that great hall of faith previous to this chapter. And we can lose them into their examples and we see a man like David, a man after God's own heart, the murderer and adulterer, David. Sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? How could he be a man after God's own heart? He sinned. Oh yes, he sinned. He sinned big time, right? Sin is sin. See, the thing about it is, he sought God's forgiveness, and he truly repented. And so regardless of where you've been, and regardless of what you've done, and regardless of how you might struggle, you seek God, and you seek Him through Christ, you find your identity there. That it can be said of you, that you are a man, a woman, after God's own heart. For your life is hidden with Christ and God. First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 and tw- through 24. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. For even hereunto were you called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. But when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. This is what you've been called to. A life that is hidden, a life that is identified with this, that Jesus took your sins, And he nailed them to a cross. When Jesus hung suspended by those nails on the cross, he wasn't really hung by nails. He was hung by love. Nails cannot hold the Son of God to a cross. If he didn't want to be there for you, for me, he wouldn't have been there. But he chose to sacrifice himself. Why? Because he is the only pure and holy sacrificial lamb who could have paid that price for you and me. And you know, sometimes when I struggle, I remind myself. I remind myself of the fact that Jesus chose to die on that cross for me. And that makes me want to live for him. That makes me want to be holy for him. To be pure for him. To show him how much I love him. Because he's already shown me how much he loves me. You see, in order to rise, I must first be buried. In order to be buried, I must first die. And we talk about that, but have you thought about the implications of that? And Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, 
but Christ lives in me. If you have been raised with Christ, then your life will be hidden with Christ in God. He said, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ. What is that? It means that I stopped existing for myself and being identified of myself, and I put to death that man of sin. I put to death that woman of sin, and, and I crucified that, and I was buried with Christ, and I rose up victoriously with him, and there as I encountered his death, burial, and resurrection, his blood became my atonement. My life is hidden. You know what that does? That, that lets me begin to live, understanding that, lets me begin to live without pride which gets in my way. And, and, and instead of seeing how that people have hurt me, that I, I seek to see rather that my life is hidden in Christ and it's really not about me. And so I then... I'm compelled to take that situation and to, uh, to glorify him because it's his identity that I bear. Uh, I told him I would use this in a sermon I, uh, and, and not, not just, just happened about a week ago. And, and I know it's a small thing, but you would have to know this guy. You'd have to know him. I understand uh, his mindset. His name is Reed. And... Um, we were playing bocce ball. I don't know if you know what bocce ball is or not, but uh, I'm sure if you haven't been introduced to it, I, I will be glad to introduce you to it. It's a fun game. And we were playing bocce ball, and one of our friends, in a joking way, kind of picked up a ball and kind of tossed it at him. And those things are heavy, you know. And uh, he was joking with him, but it was, you know, it was kind of like, you know, you can't catch this, and it dropped to the ground at his feet. And he reached down, and it was actually the guy who threw it at him, it was his ball. And he reached down and picked it up and handed it to him. And I said, you have just displayed the Spirit of Christ. And we were good friends, it was all in fun, you know. But that's what it's about, folks. That's what it's about. And that's what enables us to show people lit with Christ, show people Christ in our lives when we realize that it's not about me, it's about Him. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, tells us how that we can be buried with Christ and be raised with Him as we die to sin. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. You see, there's that same concept again, and once more it is associated with dying and being raised with Christ, having a new life. What is the new life? It's not that just that I make different choices. No, that's not it. And I, and I think sometimes that, you know, we, we don't do people justice when we... we we lead them to the water with that idea that, well, you're going to go down and come back up and you're going to start making different choices. That's not it. You don't start making different choices. You become a different person who lives a different life, who has a different identity, a new life, a newness of life found in Christ. And then, then you really start to live then you understand what victory is about. Then, your mind, your affections, are set on heaven. And this life 
becomes nothing more than the passage that you're taking to get home. Don't let anything turn you away from your way home. And so I ask you tonight, if, if you're a child of God, if you've indeed been buried with Christ, if you have encountered Him in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, because that is the way and the only way that you can put on Christ, is to be buried with Him in the waters of baptism. And if you haven't done that, what are you waiting on? If you haven't done that, then why don't tonight you begin living finally? Not just living the rest of your life, but really, truly living and understanding what it means to live and to walk with God and to be headed home. I encourage you. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as the Son of God and be buried with Him in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins. Walking a new life, a new person. You can have that tonight. Tonight. It's in your grasp. It is a step away. Take that first step. Come out of that pew. That's heaven. Child of God, are you absolute? Were you able to say it? Were you able to say it? I am forgiven. Are you absolutely sure? Anything less, let us pray with you for you while we stand and sing.